Dream, search, drive. Cars.coza. Hello and welcome back to the Cars of Coza podcast studio. My name is Chira Siena, and again, it gives me great pleasure to welcome engineer extraordinaire, car journalist, and now bulletproofer of cars, uh, Nicol Lowe. Nicol, how are you? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me back, Jiro. Uh, it's such a pleasure. I've been looking forward to this chat for a long time. Now, if you're out there listening or watching this and you didn't see our first podcast with Nickel, it was about bulletproofing or armoring vehicles in South Africa. Nickel uh, is uh, involved with SVI Engineering, Business Development Manager, if I'm not mistaken, uh, who are the largest armorers of cars in South Africa and, um, and make amazing military vehicles as well. So the link to that podcast will be above my head and in the description below. Uh, but a quick reintroduction to Nickel. Uh, Nickel has worked for very large manufacturers from Ford to ProDrive and then uh, built Bentley engines, uh, did climactic sign-off on, on Ford engines, uh, driving them in minus 37 degrees and uh, and a couple of other uh, career movements, ended up as the technical editor of Car Magazine before SVI. Uh, we have a, a, we've known each other for a long time. You once scared the hell out of me on the in the French mountains in a, in a Mustang bullet. And somewhere in all of that, Nickel was involved in building what would have been a world first in South Africa, uh, an electric vehicle known as the Optimal Energy Jewel. And that is what we are here to chat about today. Nicole, thanks again. I think let's get stuck into it. Tell us the, let's start with the Optimal Energy story. Yeah, so Optimal Energy was a company that started in 2005 uh, by Kubis Meiring, and he was really a visionary back then. I mean, if you watch some of the clips, even now, 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, he basically told the electric car story as we have it today, and that is that is quite a something. So it started in 2005 with the development of the Jewel. Um, in the beginning, it was seen as a passenger car, but it could also have been a van because they needed to sort of keep their options open. So the first one was a six-seater concept. You wouldn't believe what car they used as sort of the volume and seating arrangement idea. That's, that's fascinating. Fiat, yeah. Fiat Multipla. Oh, that was sort of used as the volume and seating arrangement vehicle. Oh, I see. So, so it would have been th so two rows of three seats. Exactly. That was the first car that actually went to the Paris Motor Show in 2008 and, cr and created such a stir. That's where the whole story really sort of kicked off and started to snowball. So, I mean, I was working for Ford in the UK at the time when I heard about the South African electric car. And I think we're a bit um, naughty in South Africa that we always sort of embrace the the bad news and never the good news so you think about oh, what joke is this south african electric car electric cars there's no future we're working internal combustion engines um but we saw this and it it created a stir i mean we all knew about uh, tesla back then with a sort of lotus 7 derived sports car electric and we all know about elon musk and tesla now but mm. back then it was new nobody thought electric cars will really kick off and now this is the South African electric car. And it, it, it really caught my attention. So the Jewel, uh, so t 2005, Optimal Energy sort of dreamt this up and, and hit the drawing board. So that's 18 years ago. And when the Jewel went to the Paris Motor Show in 08, I think I'm correct in saying that Tesla had not released a four-door car yet they mm. only had the lotus based roadster yeah at the time there were a lot of startup companies i mean optimal energy was also a startup company but most of the electric cars back then were like milk floats these ugly little <laughs> boxes nobody <laughs> wanted to drive them and i think optimal energy they were one of the first companies out there that would have developed something and they did develop something that was sort of interesting to look at because it was a real car it was a serious product so the first car to market, passenger vehicle, five-door car with, and I've driven one, it had terrible range, was the Nissan Leaf. And that also, you, the, the Jewel would have predated, it would have beat the Leaf to the market as well. I believe it was very much a parallel sort of race okay. between Optimal Energy's Jewel and the Leaf. But mm. I think we got the uh, Leaf beat in many, many of, many of the, the goals that we achieved before them. 
obviously we'll talk about what happened later in the jewel project mm. and when the funding started to dry up i think all the rest could have sort of caught up or catch up mm. with the technology but yeah it was very exciting times in the beginning eh? so obviously we'll put uh, if you're listening to this on a on a podcast platform you won't see this so you'll have to go to our youtube channel but if you're watching on youtube right now you'll see the overlay and we'll have we'll have footage of the jewel and what it looked like and let's maybe start with the design because i found the design quite striking and also quite familiar and that's because a very prominent british designer actually penned the jewel for you yes so keith keith halford uh, we all know him for projects like the iconic Jaguar XJ220 supercar, which mm. was sort of the fastest car back then. Mm. And if you look at the styling of that car and you look at the jewel, you can sort of see the, mm. where the influence come from. Um, so he really, I mean, to shape that car the way he did from like sort of a box, because the engineering point of view, you will give them a space envelope and say, well, this is the space we need for the occupant cell. You create a car over it and it's electric car. So you will see if you look at the design, the nose is very short and we'll come to some ergonomic failures of the car a bit later. <laughs> but the nose was a really short nose because there's no internal combustion engine there. Um, and it's also shaped a bit like a van because that was also a plan that it might be a delivery van or it might be a passenger car, not sure. But flowing lines, um, when it came out, I mean, 2008 and then later in 2010, it also went to Geneva. Um, I think it, it on paper it looked a bit dated the shape because at that time it was going edgy uh, that was still rounded shapes but I must say in the metal it was actually a good looking car mm. I, I've I've never seen one in the metal um, unfortunately uh, and Keith Helfett uh, he went on to have quite a long career with Jaguar Land Rover if I'm not mistaken correct that predated yeah. the jewel really but I mean okay. he did a lot of work for Jaguar he also did some industrial design even medical equipment mm. and things like that so he's really a talented guy mm. Um, so it was very exciting. That was part of it. I mean, when I heard of the project, I heard we were sort of involved. And just to, to um, finish with Kubis Mayer, mm. I mean, that guy, uh, he was involved with the SALT uh, project, but he was also involved with Roy, Roy Falk, which oh, is yes. an attack helicopter. Yes, so world when, class. So when yeah. I heard about this optimal energy, and I said, I thought, yo, I want to get involved with this. Mm. I also was looking to, to come back to South Africa. And uh, a job opened up as an integration engineer and I applied and to cut the long story short, I went for an interview, got the job. We all knew we were in for some bumpy, uh, bumpy ride. <laughs> well, I don't know how bumpy it's yeah. going to be. It was a startup. It was exciting. I was young and I was thinking, I'd imagine it worked. Mm. How great it would be to have a South African developed car, to have a South African automotive industry, mm. not just building cars, developing cars and exporting, selling all over the world. It's I mean, when I joined Optimal Energy sort of 2010, um, they, all, everyone worked there like had bumper stickers on their cars that said, I would rather be driving a Jewel. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was the sort of energy in the yeah. team back then. How many, so it was Cape Town based? And how many people say at the peak were involved? So at the peak, around 100. It's kind um, of a big team, man. Eh? It was a big team. It's a big and, salary and, bill. And <laughs> most of them, most of, we'll talk about money a bit later. <laughs> but uh, most of, uh, about, I would say, 40 to 50 engineers working there. So sure. when it started up, I think it was interesting, the team they got together. Mm. Um, they obviously had 100, uh, a lot of people, mm. um, a lot of experience there. But it was an odd team in the sense it was completely multicultural, multi-personality as well. Because you can imagine, if you're in South Africa, you've got a good job, why would you move? So maybe it was people looking for a new challenge. Maybe they didn't quite fit in where they were. So it was a, a random bunch of people, highly talent, talented, a lot of IQ in that team that came together and then started working on the jewel. So when the energy was still high, I mean... I was talking about you just before the podcast. 2010 was also the, the Soccer World Cup in mm. South Africa. Remember the Vuvuzelas? Mm. So that sort of energy w went into this team. And we were excited because we could see it was going somewhere. We got the backing of government. We all know about uh, development uh, in technology, uh, science, uh, mm. IDC, TR. They all were involved uh, with the jewel, also funded it. So we had government backing. Wow. And that's not an easy thing not to achieve. Not an yeah. easy, easy thing. So we were we were at the point where, the pro we can talk about the prototypes now as well, but mm. we had four prototypes in 2010, 2011 that was given to journalists to drive and yes. to get the message out there to show this is real. This is not a pipe dream. Here's the car. And and that my colleague, uh, Hannes Wester, is in, in 
formerly your colleague as well, actually drove that car. I think he drove it four up to her minus in blistering heat, no problems, charged it overnight in her minus out of a wall plug and, and came back. He remembers that very fondly. He's told me that story a couple of times. And uh, well, let's, let's maybe see, let's maybe start with what was Jewel aiming for in terms of battery size, range, uh, motor output? What was kind of, what, what were you aiming for? Okay, so the specifications from an engineering point of view on the project, so it had a 70 kilowatt electric motor with about 250 newton meters. Front or rear axle? No, all front, front, mm. front driven, mm. uh, front engined as well. The battery pack was around 36 kilowatt hours, which is small compared to today's electric cars, like 90, 100 kilowatt hours. The Nissan Leaf was sort of launched with a usable uh, kilowatt hour, about 25, so a bit smaller than than, mm. um, than the Jewel. Um, zero, they always claimed zero to 60 times. That was interesting. Nah. No, zero to 100 time officially. Zero to 60 was less than five seconds. Top speed, 135 kilometers per hour. We know the zero to 100 is about 12 to 14 seconds. Mm. But remember, it's a single speed gearbox as well. Um, so when I got to the Jewel, that was my first electric car I ever drove. Wow. It was the Jewel. Um, and it was amazing because you hear about its milk floats and it's not a real car. And then you get into this thing and oh, now we take electric cars for granted. Being a journalist, you drive everything now mm. and still. But to get in a car that's completely si silent, you switch it on, you hear a bit of whizzing and things, but that's all. You put your foot in the accelerator and you go, that instant talk. I mean, the prototype vehicles, um, they obviously weren't as well insulated as a production car. So you could hear the rubber of the wheels on the tar change yes. sound during coasting, acceleration, and braking. It was the weirdest thing because mm. it's completely silent. You can hear the, you can actually hear the brake pads clamping on the discs. And, and that doesn't happen a lot because you had yeah. regenerative braking. Oh, so of single pedal driving. Wow. So what they did was when you let go of the accelerator, mm. it will actually regen and put obviously some of the kinetic energy back yes. into, as electricity into the battery. Which and that a, slowed you down. Which is a technology now that we, we all sort of, under, well, if you've driven electric, you understand yes. how that works and one pedal driving for me is a wonderful way of commuting once yes. you get used to it you yes. actually when you go back to ice car and you have to use the brake pedal you're like what is this nonsense you know mm. why doesn't it break itself yeah. <laughs> and, so just the experience of driving a south mm. african bolt car and it was it was good yeah and how did you build the prototypes okay so the prototypes, they looked really pretty on pictures and so on, but they were really kit cars. They <laughs> space-framed vehicles yeah. built uh, by Jimmy Price, high-tech industries or technologies there in PE. They, they, built, the, they built the Noble, yes. the Daytona Coupe. Correct. Uh, and the GT40 reps. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. So they know what they're doing. Mm. Um, to build it from a computer design and then, I mean, Keith Halford input as well because they didn't have like clay. They used a special technique to get the shapes right. And it was um, fiberglass bodied. Mm. But underneath the fiberglass body was like a space frame, a metal pipe space frame. And then obviously very neatly covered in leather and materials and so on. It was really well done. But essentially what you see, the, the pictures out there, they had four really nice prototypes, but they were kit cars. Did, did one of the those four? See, the one that you see. So the one that Johannes drove was a white one that was a, 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 also the cover of Car Magazine. Yes. There's a few other color, colors as well. The original one that went to the Paris Motor Show was a silver one. In I remember. That was a six-seater. We've got footage of that. Yes. Mm. And then we ch they changed over to a five-seater. And then we had four beautiful prototypes that were handed out to media. There was one uh, sort of not-so-nice one which was used for the engineering testing. Mm. And then we also had a Ford Bantam created to as a prototype mule was that sort of powertrain uh, to also just get some data and so on from engineering point i see of view. and and your your input here you said you were integrations engineer so uh, i must i'm going to be completely honest with you uh, you're going to need to walk me through what that means because <laughs> i'm a bit ignorant or naive to what what your job would have been uh, with jewel so you've got all these specific engineering teams one is doing battery development and to just to tell you about battery development, we did the whole battery by ourselves. It was pouch cells, looks like sachets that was imported from China, put together as a battery pack. You had a battery control system that need to monitor these cells, need to charge them up equally. That was a massive thing to do. The cost of one of those batteries and that back then was like 500,000 rands for each prototype. Yeah. Okay? So you had a battery team, you had a 
propulsion team for looking at the, 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 the powertrain in the engine, for example. You had chassis development. You had the, the body and white sort of development. So you've got all these individual teams. And what I would have done is as integration in, uh, engineer, you need to see how these all, all these subsystems fit together. So they link between all these systems to actually build a car, to, to create one car. So they all talk, sort um, of talk to each other and yes. understand each other and also present the driver with the right information on the, on the instrument cluster. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and just to put it in perspective, to build a prototype like that is extremely expensive. If I remember correctly, and it's now 10 years ago, just a disclaimer out there as well, so all this information, please fact check because it's 10 <laughs> years ago. But I remember something in the region of 5 million Rand per prototype vehicle. Wow. That was a sort of, and you talk about instrument cluster. If you see the videos online, look at that instrument cluster. I, mm. I actually thought it was really neatly done. You had the speed that would roll, almost like a calendar in front of you. <laughs> and that, it had like the range of a battery that would shrink in front of you. Uh, it was really a neat uh, development of, of a digital cluster, which was. So it was a fully neat. digital yeah. instrument cluster, yeah. Yes, and some alpha switch gear in yeah. there as well. <laughs> some alpha switch <laughs> yes, gear. Yes, the DNA switch was the like drive, neutral, reverse. <laughs> <laughs> the DNA Alpha switch. Uh, interesting. Okay, so you just raided Alpha's parts basket. Exactly, basically. Yeah. exactly. <laughs> That's very interesting. Were the batteries lithium-based? Lithium-ion. Mm -hmm. um, one interesting test we do uh, did was, obviously, you need to make sure that it will be safe in the crash. So we wanted to see how much energy is in the pouch cell. So we drove a nail through one. Uh, we, st we stood away. We built a machine that would drive the nail through, and we had, obviously, high-speed uh, videoing on it. Fireworks like I haven't seen for a while. <laughs> so I can tell you, we sort of scared about gasoline or petrol igniting. Uh, Lithium-ion battery is not far off. Eh? Mm. Mm. Uh, uh, and that is obviously a concern today for some people with EVs. But I actually did a bit of research into this because there was a, an argument happening on Twitter that uh, Teslas are just going to kill everyone because they're all going to explode. And statistically speaking, a Tesla, I think combust at something like a third or a fifth or self self combust at a third or a fifth of what an ice car does around the world so they took the stats tesla obviously did this and then you know the, the stats came out in tesla's favor but would do you think that let's say say you're cruising down the highway i don't know a truck sheds something in front of you something falls off a bucky and penetrates that battery i mean are, are you in a bit of trouble there if, as you're, you're inside the jewel or in any electric car actually yeah, so the advantage of the battery pack is because it's the most heavy part of the car, they put mm -hmm. it right at the floor between the wheels. So it is sort of protected in that area. Okay. And on the Jewel, the battery pack weighed 300 kilograms. Mm. Um, and it is well protected. Um, but yeah, if if you sort of link the positives and the negatives of the battery pack, it no, would be nice. But remember, they're all made up of cells and there's sort of a safety bolt in that uh, is sort of compartments in the battery. So you hope that the whole thing wouldn't catch a light at the same time. Uh, and, just maybe one and pouch. There, yeah. yeah, and there's obviously also the major like a, a disconnect or trip switch that will trip in case of an accident to just disconnect the electric battery from the rest uh, of the car. So it was a lot done. I mean, um, from a safety point of view, if there was a crash, we had to train the people they can't use the jaws of life in the middle of the car because they can cut through the battery. Mm. So those, those were all planned when, it, when Jewel would have rolled out. And, well, let's quickly chat about range and then I want to go back to the battery. So I drove the Leaf and I, I don't even think I made 80 Ks on a full battery around Cape Town, urban driving. What what was your sort of claim, um, your best claimed range on the Jewel and what was sort of real world uh, achievable in the Jewel? So they were aiming for 300 kilometers on a single charge. Wow. Back then was great. On um, a, only the, on a 36 yes, kilowatt hour battery? Yes, wow. but also the car weighed only 1.2 tons. Uh, which is very light for electric car. Mm. And I think it's because it's a prototype and remember all the safety systems and things weren't in place. Mm. Um, but I know the real world range were probably closer to 200 kilometers because I know one of the runs we did was up to Mariasburg from Cape Town and back. And that's like 100 and 100, so 200 kilometer round mm. trip. And it could do that, which is, which is not bad for... 2010 oh, would have been double what um, the leaf could do and exactly and then um also i mean they at the time i think they were at like eight thousand kilometers real world driving with that fleet of four vehicles so it was going great guns back then yeah it's amazing to me that a company with the history and the might of of nissan they i mean they they were the first to to market with a series production four-door five-door electric car and um 
uh, it's amazing to me that a small, smaller South African startup, well, compared to the size of a company like Nissan, could cre- create something with real world double the range of, of something from a, a titan like Nissan. I think back in the day, electric cars were thought of as city runabouts. Mm. So the Nissan Leaf, the first one range, they claimed about 150 kilometers, mm. but that was very optimistic. optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> um, and even like the next one that we saw was BMW i3. It was also a city car. So I think back then people were thinking they will only use electric vehicles in cities and not long distance. But now we're seeing sort of a change mm. because if you're going to remove ice from the equation, you have to have a, a range or usable range. I, I drove the very first i3. BMW gave it to us to film. We'll put a link to that film. You'll, you'll see a much younger, more hair version of me, skinnier. And um, I enjoyed my time in that car, but I also didn't even get 100Ks range. And that was no highway driving, which is obviously an EV's kind of less preferred environment. Is It prefers urban driving. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, basically, and that was 2014 the i3 came out. So you were way ahead of BMW as well, you know. Correct, correct. Yeah. So I just want to talk about sure. the high point of Jewel. So mm. that was back in 2010, Soccer World Cup, Vuvuzela, the team was excited. And we started to contract international teams to help because obviously from to move from a prototype like we've seen in the pictures, to a real production version of this car. It takes massive effort. So we would have used EDAC, it's the German company that does it for a lot of other OEMs as well. They would have taken the prototype and converted it to a body in white that can be mass produced. So they were tasked with that and they came over. I mean, we had loads of uh, German engineers running around in Cape Town. We actually had an office being prepared for all the German engineers that would come in um, and they actually worked already on the, the project to show us how it will have to change. The shape of Jewel will have to change when it goes into production. And that was a bit weird in a sense that they had, I remember the one meeting. They had the Jewel up on the screen, the EDAC engineers, and they showed, okay, the nose is too short for passenger protection for um, actually, not passenger, to- but sorry. It the nose uh, was too short for pedestrian protection uh, okay. because there's like no space between the bonnet and what's underneath. So you need the nose and also crumple zones and so on. So the nose need to be lengthened. And they did a few other changes, the ergonomic failures of when you climb into the, the prototype jewel, you, your feet had to go past the A-pillar to get to the, the pedals a long way. So you, when you want to get out, you're sort of stuck inside. So the A-pillar needed to move. Sure. A few things needed to move and they showed how it will change on the screen. And you know what? Mm. It changed into a leaf. <laughs> <laughs> for, for real. That was the shape of the leaf. So those regulations would have been laid down by, say, the EU. And if you wanted to sell your car in the EU, you had to meet those regulations. Yes, so type approval would have meant that the jewel shape would have changed. So don't think that the jewel shape as we know it, that's the one that would have gone into mass production. No, it would have changed a lot. Was a monocog or unibody jewel ever built? No, never. Uh, unfortunately, didn't get to that stage. Mm. Um, but also at the time, we uh, worked with Idihada, which is a Spanish company. And they were involved with vehicle testing. So they would have taken the production vehicle through all the testing needed. Climatic testing, durability testing. I actually flew to Ideara to meet the team over there. Uh, and you had experience in this, obviously. Yes. And what was a bit interesting is we were sitting in this meeting room discussing the whole electric future program and so on. And just outside the room on one of the test tracks, one of the Formula One teams still with a V8 naturally aspirated 2.4, giving it beams. Wow. Yeah. Difficult to concentrate on an <laughs> electric future with that in the background. Uh, yeah, um, well, I was very lucky to hear the V8s in, I went to Spa, yes. uh, the last year of the V8. So I know what you're talking about. It's a very, it's like a haunting noise, but in a good way. It's a, it's an incredible noise, yeah. And the other interesting thing was Idiado was doing the same kind of testing for other OEMs, also working on electric cars. And oh. we sort of asked them, so are you off the record, are you working on the Leaf? Because we knew about the Leaf the, or the new Nissan. I don't even know if the name was out yet. They say, yeah, maybe. And then <laughs> they showed us a facility and we went around this corner and the guy just froze like 
solid. And she said, no, 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 no. <laughs> out here, out here, out here. Like, it's still a glimpse of a leaf. Is it, there. eh? Okay. But so. prototype vehicle. Yes. Prototype. So we were very close. We were very, at the same time, developing those cars. So it was side by side, mm. eh? I wonder if in Nissan head office in Japan, they were like, oh, these bloody South Africans giving us headaches. Yeah. I wonder if they sped their program up, actually, because of you. They must have known about you. I mean, if, if you were using the same Spanish company, there's yeah. you know, a crossover there, you know? No, for sure. But I think the problem with Jewel is always a new company. It's a startup. It's an unknown brand name. Yeah. Um, it would have taken a lot to really rival the uh, existing OEM. Yes. Yeah. So the, the Jewel story changed it pivoted at the paris motor show were you there in paris or do you have no. some stories from from paris so that was before my time okay. but what really happened when the program kicked off in south africa the idea was to sort of slowly grow the pro the program mm. so they talk about english uh, the, the the slogan they use is crawl walk run that's a way to to grow mm. but what happened in 2008 so i think the idea was to build a small volume hand built sell it to South Africans. Mm. Even the problem is when you build small volumes, it's really expensive. So at, if you look at the slope of volume versus unit cost, um, if you build like between 10 and 20 units of the jewel, it would have probably cost a million rand each. Yeah. But you could then sell it maybe to government and they don't buy the whatever at the time S classes or what they were mm. driving and say, what well, do you force them to drive locally produced vehicles and that will give the company chance to sort of ramp up slowly and then get into the the market and then maybe see if we can export but what happened in paris is they took over the show the jewel the jewel if you see the coverage i received from that motor show was incredible because electric cars were like a niche back then this mm. was a serious car the publicity they got was amazing and i think the exco at the time thought to themselves we've got something here why are we going to build small volumes, maybe looking at vans and stuff? If we got a passenger car that can put South Africa on the map, let's go for 50,000 units a year. The program was called P50K because you look at, the, again, that volume versus unit cost. They were trying to get the, the jewel in at the time below 300,000 rand selling price, and, which, which was great. Actually. And in the context of the market then, I mean... The Jewel always sort of looked to me like a Renault Scenic, you know, that kind of shape. That, because MPVs died, obviously, you don't, no one buys MPVs anymore. But then there's actually quite a few MPVs on the road. Yes. And I must, maybe we'll try to put on the screen uh, what a Renault Scenic or something like that would have cost in South Africa. But I think at 300, you were probably approaching ICE vehicle parity, I would say. Yes. Uh, just off the top of my and head. Also, what uh, I think what was also um, looking forward back then was they were planning to lease you the battery, so that would have brought the cost down even more, like down even to two two hundred and forty thousand, and then they lease you the battery, so you don't because the battery is one of the most expensive components mm. in the car. Um, I can tell you during the development, we were even uh, involved with an Israeli company called Better Place. Um, Shai Agassi was, was also oh, a visionary I know back this then. Story Swa the swappable batteries, batteries. battery swapping. Yes. So that was also an idea. Why don't we do battery swapping? Because that will take charging and everything out of the equation. Mm. But Better Place is also no more, I believe. Yes, no. They and didn't. the reason is the the cost of the batteries. If you imagine the capital investment, if you know how to have spare batteries at let's call it fueling station for EVs or mm. battery swapping stations, um, who would pay for that? Mm. Uh, and then the problem is, who do the batteries belong to? Because if you've got a good battery, you swap it for a bad battery, you, the batteries need to belong to the OEM. So now you need more capital for all these batteries. Uh. So it was a great idea in principle because it takes the same time that you would fill an ice car with petrol or diesel, even quicker sometimes to do a, a battery drop, yeah. battery change, and off you go. Um, so yeah, battery leasing was also playing to to get the price, the cost price of the car down. The the company, I think the only company that has made commercial battery swapping work is Neo, and only in certain markets. Because Tesla, Elon's been uh, Musk has been asked a lot of times, why don't you do swappable batteries? And he just doesn't believe in the concept. And maybe it's just because it's like you said, it's a financial reason. The OEM needs to hold all the batteries. And that requires massive capital. But Neo actually stuck it out. And what's quite interesting, I don't know if you picked it up, but um, in a couple of sub-Saharan African countries now, very successfully, they a couple of companies are running hot, uh, swappable battery bikes. 
it's actually really working, uh, which is actually really interesting. Maybe may the the financial model works better for motorbikes for, for a smaller value. Yeah, yeah. Correct, correct, which is really interesting. So okay, so so two thousand and eight, the jewel goes to the Paris show. We've got footage of that. We'll put it on the screen right now. Interest is massive. Everyone comes back to South Africa and goes right. Let's let's mass produce here, and then to build a production facility to make fifty thousand cars. It, to my limited knowledge, is billions of rand like now you're playing big leagues so where do you get the billions from so that's where the problem started so they say the total investment in jewel uh, was around just over 300 million rands but then to bridge the gap to well, they already identified uh, in the Kuga region in the in eastern cape uh, where the facility would be to build these 50,000 units per year and for all the development work, the contracting of the overseas company, as we discussed before, everything there, the total bill of money needed was lo- around 9 billion rands. Wow. So from 300 million to 9 billion, that's a big jump. 14 years ago. That's a big jump. With inflation, you probably had and, like... And one thing that we keep forgetting is another government project failed back then. The pe- uh, pe- pebble pebble bed, re- bed reactor. Maybe we should have stuck onto that one. <laughs> <laughs> but so I the mean, government that, that took six billion rand with it, and I think the government back then just couldn't stomach another loss like this. So the government had funded Pebble Bed. Pebble Bed. I actually don't know too much about it, but it's it was pretty cool. I think there was there was it was close to becoming like real world commercialized technology, and government put six billion into that then Kobus Mayron came along a founder of Obstacle Energy and he asked for 9 billion 9 billion ah, ah and government problem. said thanks but no, no thanks no. but wasn't there wasn't there a day where the the um the, the the appropriate minister came to Cape Town and drove the jewel and everything was kind of looking rosy for a little while it was it was um so we had all the ministers there um the four prototypes were in a row shiny with drivers taking the ministers around Cape Town on this dedicated loop everyone was smiling very happy I mean you, you can't not be influenced if you're in that car and you think it's probably South African and it works it was an amazing feeling but I think the problem was the the jump to 50,000 from building from four 50. prototypes. Yeah. Um, also, if you look at then the competitor, let's call the competitor the Nissan Leaf, which it was, in their first year of production, and this is now OEM with big budgets and development and so on, so they launched the car towards the end of 2010, actually 2011. The first year of sales was something like 22,000 units globally yeah. from a known OEM. So how would an uh, unknown quantity like yeah. the jewels sell 50,000? So it was a bit much. Um, and that was the big problem then. You know, hindsight is always twenty twenty, And sometimes, I don't know, I'm not, not really one of those people that's like things happen for a reason. I think things happen and then other things happen because that thing happened, you know. And Paris obviously would have been very exciting and the fact that you know you had a stall there and Optimal Energy took the car over and was there and had all this incredible attention but it it does make me think that if Paris had never happened that maybe the jewel actually would have happened. Yeah, as I mentioned, the slow progression because then mm. what essentially happened, I talked about crawl, walk, run. Mm. It was run, fall, crawl. <laughs> Shame. Unfortunately, Shame, yeah. back then. So... Um, if we talk about what happened since then, basically the high Ethereum era of, of Jewel, how did it actually then start going down until the demise of the Jewel? Mm. So the easiest way to stop a project is stop funding. Yeah. And how to frustrate the engineering team is to tell them there's no money for further development or mm. we can't even go and do more testing because the money has stopped. So you take the data that you've got, and just re reevaluate it and re relook at it. And you do that like a couple of times. You think, okay, I've done this now. I need something new to move forward. And if you haven't got money, you can't. Um, so at the time, I think the whole attitude of even the workforce sort of changed, as it would. I mean, from having this company booming and we're going worldwide, we, we, we've got a location where we'll produce these cars to no, no, hang on. We have to wait for funding. And then government basically said, like, 
if this is a commercial commercially viable project, then you should be able to get funding from elsewhere. There should be investors from that private will, equity yeah. that will basically put their money up and say, "Well, then go and do it. Why do we need to fund it?" Mm. Um, and that is what happened. They tried to get funding from all sorts. I mean, there were talks about Jaguar Land Rover, Tata, some Chinese companies. There was a big effort to try and secure funding for the jewel. And while that was happening, um, the project was sort of idling in the sense that they started with these work packages that we had to do to keep busy and look at how we can sort of um, make it better, but without spending money. It was <laughs> very difficult. Yeah. Um, I can tell you from a marketing point of view of Jewel, I think they were also leading in that sense that um, the sales model of Jewel, you wouldn't have had the, the um, traditional dealerships. It would have been in malls. It would have been in a high-end shopping uh, centers so like boutique little exactly. stores and you would have walked in there they may might have had like one jewel on display mm. but they will have like all the colors everything you can choose so you spec it on maybe a even augmented reality we can walk and see the jewel Look, that would, would have been way ahead and, of and time imagine eh? and then you can order your jewel it would have been obviously produced and stored somewhere it would have been home deliveries you would have received your new car at home brilliant so uh, things like that i think was like really nice but then as i say the funding sort of slowly dried up and as a workforce back then i mean we knew it was a risky project um but at the time we also had these sort of board meetings or even company meetings we'll go to this room and then Kubus maiden will say okay we spoke to the idc this is now what's going to happen and uh, we're expecting more funding to be released next week so just keep going we're almost there and it's that that anxiety of will we will we get paid by the end of the month and to go through that yeah, cycle every tough. month um it's draining mm. emotionally financially mm. <laughs> you worried um and there's a lot of people that gave up a lot to be part of the the jewel team i mean there's people that let go of massive positions with other OEMs to help the jewel. And they, I think the the feeling inside the team sort of just changed. You know, I can't help but ask is, do you know what happened to the prototypes? As far as I know, the prototypes are with the Nelson Mandela University, the NPE. The problem with those batteries, if they're not cared for, they're not plugged in, if they die, if they go beyond, beyond a certain level of charge, they're gone. So hopefully they're still in one piece. Maybe they can let us know because they would have been used for student projects and so on. That was the, the end of it. But what's also sad, when something like Pebble Bed or the Jewel, when, when it is gone, you get the scattering of talent because people need to start looking for new jobs mm. now. And I know with Jewel, um, a lot of people went abroad to the US. There's some people in Dubai that still got contact with. Um, I talk about the brain drain in the country. So this this program brought a lot of people back to South Africa. And once it's gone, everyone just went out again to go and obviously find a job somewhere. Do you think it's technically possible to replace the old batteries with modern cell-based batteries and, and get those things going again? I'm sure, but you just need money. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> Which is in short supply. Well, uh, um, maybe I can convince the... Uh, the the MD of Casa Cosa to give me some marketing budget. Yeah. Imagine what about? I mean, imagine we get those things. I'm just spitballing here. This I haven't thought about this before this very moment. Get them, wrap them red, put Casa Cosa branding, and get these jewels back on the road. I mean, it's really an amazing it story. Be, it will be brilliant. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But if we talk about how could it have been different? Could it have been different? I think there's a couple of things that counted against the Jewel project. I mentioned the one that they're aiming too high, the 50,000 units. Looking back is always easier eh? to, to, to criticize and say, back then it looked like guns blazing, let's go. If we stuck to the small number of, of vehicles mm. built, I think that could have worked. Hand built, plant here somewhere, mm. we produce a couple of small numbers per year. I think what also counted against the Jewel was it was so early. You couldn't buy like off the shelf shelf batteries. You couldn't, uh, we did source the, the, the electric motor was sourced. We were busy developing our own one, but that also got sort of stopped because of funding. But imagine we, we started the project now. You could have sourced all the components. I think you can actually, if we started the project, but later you weren't one of the early, early startup companies that might've been better for Jewel. 
Maybe they were too 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 ahead of the yeah cur- of the curve back then. You know, I had dinner with one of the founders of Casa Cosa on on the weekend, and he said to me, if he if he started Casa Cosa today with everything he knew, everything he's learned over the last fifteen years, it probably wouldn't work. He they started fifteen years ago and the timing was ripe. It was basically just auto trader, you know. Um, uh, ruling the market and that was just an example of of timing and i think what happened with jewel is the the legacy oems weren't on an electric trajectory at in 20, 2008 when tesla came out and all of a sudden people were queuing to buy teslas then it was like holy crap like all the legacy oems were like all right now we, I mean, Tesla basically changed the direction of the, the modern motoring industry. They forced their hand, I'm yeah, sure. They and, forced um, their hand, yeah. And I can tell you, when I left uh, Ford in the UK to come and work for Optimal Energy, my colleagues were thinking, I'm crazy. Why would you let go of internal combustion engine future? It was going great, great guns. To give you an idea, Dunton Technical Facility, where I worked at, they had 100 engine test stands running. Uh, like 100 engines at the same time during development, petrol and diesel. So that's like a, a mounted engine. You've yes. got extraction on the exhaust. Yes. You're running Dinos, software. Yeah, you're yeah. doing all your tests. 100. 100. Hey? <laughs> yes. I phoned one of my colleagues the other day. I asked him, how many of the engine test stands now in the Dundon Technical Facility are running as we speak? He told mm. me three. <laughs> yeah. No more engine development. That's it. Internal combustion engines. It, all the money is going to so electric. going to electric. And back then, when I moved to Jewel, they had like an electric focus thing they were working on, but also not really because they thought this stuff. What, yeah. What's it? What's the point? Electric I mean, cars. I mean, the lithium mining industry would have been in its inf- infancy in the nor- in the noughties, in the two thousands. You know, I mean, uh, uh, I don't even think that the main mine, which I think is in Chile, I don't even think it existed yet. You know, the one, and now you look at what um, what Tesla has achieved, and they had to, I mean, to get cell technology right, that to partner with Panasonic, and and there was a massive effort just to get the cells right. And basically, I don't think, I think without Tesla, I don't think we'd be where the industry wouldn't be where it is today. No, 100%. And you guys were pre-Tesla, essentially, you know? I mean, they had the Roadster, but I mean, what, they built, I don't know, 500 Roadsters or something like that. And they lost and some, they, some due to fire. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> and they just re-engineered a Lotus, really. I mean, yes. at the end of the day, yes. it wasn't a, it wasn't what you guys were trying to do, create a custom monocog and all the rest of it. You, I mean, you're ahead of BMW with the i3. The i3 was seen as revolutionary, but the Jewel was on at the Paris Motor Show six years before, mm. you know? It's, it's an incredible story. Story. They, they and coined the term back then, born electric. I think other OEMs have also used it now. BMW. So it was mm. actually, Jewel also had the born electric mm. because even the Leaf was based on a TDAR, Nissan TDAR platform. It wasn't a brand new oh. car for electric. Okay. The i3 was the first ground up electric car yes. designed with clean slate. So that's why I had the carbon fiber and the narrow mm. wheels and all those kind of things because they, you gave engineers the chance to do a, mm. a one a, like a ground a clean slate design. And that was the Jewel as well, a clean slate electric yeah. car design. And the first i3, I mean, what was quite incredible was the, the chassis didn't change, as I understand it. The battery cavity didn't change. But as batteries got more dense and the, the technology increased and the, the prices dropped, they just literally kept just fitting bigger batteries. Well, not bigger physically, but more dense batteries to the i3 to eventually the point where you got, I think on the BEV i3, you got 200K range or somewhere there. On the Rex, you got like 300 if you counted the the petrol range. So the range you guys had is now, I mean, i3 is discontinued, but now in 2012, Joule would have had i3 range after six updates or however many times they updated the the i3 you know correct so that was always the plan uh, to update batteries as you go along the problem with lithium ion batteries you can get the battery density better but it becomes riskier so there's a sort of uh, trade-off there so mm. how, how risky do you want to go for automotive use i see uh, you know we we put out a mercedes video on the new sl and the new eqe the fully electric video and um you know, I said in one of the videos, like, I'm not trying to be nasty, but I've, I've been doing this job for 18 years now. And like, 
the, the, and it's not just Mercedes, it's quite a few manufacturers where the cost cutting going into the cars, the quality of the vehicles, the materials, the build quality and uh, is reducing and, and I think, um, or decreasing. And I think what's happening is manufacturers are diverting all of their R&D budget to EVs to try and basically catch up with the Chinese, essentially, and catch up with Tesla, really. And the ICE cars are suffering from what I can tell. No, for sure. And if you see the development on ICE engines at the moment, non-existent, uh, if you're an ICE fan, then hopefully something like e-fuel will eventually sort of yes. <laughs> allow internal combustion Porsches, engines to, uh, Porsches, uh, <laughs> yes, to, <laughs> to, to continue. But yeah. Um, yeah, so it was also when the Jewel project, if you think about it, it would have been a second car in the household. It was never planned to be the sole car for mm. the household. It would have been a second car. They said that 200 kilometers were like 95% of people's driving needs for a day. And if you plug it in, uh, remember, it was a smallish battery. You can plug it in by your local 3.3 mm. 3 kilowatt wall socket. You don't need a fast charge or anything. So overnight, you can charge like your cell phone. So that would have been uh, the idea. They were also playing around with maybe if it was your only car, can they rent you something for the holiday? You, you can oh, sort of and in, Volvo in does that now. So yes, you would have so, been first on that as so, well. So that was also in the plan. So it was a lot of forward thinking. Um, and as I say, it was really a priority South African project. Um, the demise was very sad, I think, to see in the end and the way it all came down and and also the way it just got sort of mm. buried. But that, that is that is the way I think these projects go. But can you imagine if we had today a booming South Africa electric automotive manufacturer delivering yeah. cars to the world? It would have been amazing. And I think that was the dream of Kuvus Mayrim. It's a beautiful dream. Um, and it's so sad. I'm getting a bit of goose from Oh, uh, shame, man. It's I so can sad see, that I can it's, see your it, 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 it's, it's actually sad that it, that it demise. But yeah, yeah it is, it's one of those things. I think, so I, I had the great pleasure of spending a day with Corbus. I reached out to him. I think I just found his email address somewhere. And I reached out to him and I said, I've got the i3. Would you like to drive it? And he got back to me and said, yes, I haven't driven one. I'd love to drive one. So I got my, I, I didn't have my regular film crew then. It was quite early days of Casa Cosa. And I sort of rented this film crew who I didn't really know. And they like, they like stuffed up everything. Like I'm not a cameraman, you know. And uh, I, I didn't feel that we had done Corbus justice and we never published that film. But I wonder if I can dig it up and maybe just put some of the highlights on the screen right now. And, uh, you know, as I interviewed him while we were driving, but the bloody camera angles, you just saw like eyebrows, you know. <laughs> so it was, it was painful for me because uh, I had this wonderful moment with, as you say, and for you to call someone a visionary, yeah, that person is a visionary. Like, I, I respect your opinion massively when it comes to these things. And then I also found out that Kobus eats at my uncle's restaurant, Posticino in Seaport, like at least once a month or once a fortnight or whatever it is. So I've bumped into him a few times. And I think maybe what will be nice is in our new podcast studio, I'd love to get you and him in together. And we, because we'll have a bit more space and, you know, we can do a double interview, which will be cool. So we'll have you back again. And we need to have you back to talk about climactic testing because that's that's fant uh, really, really interesting stuff. Did you, did you just out of interest, is that place, it's called Eierploch, is it in northern Sweden? Did you test there? No, we went to Robin Nimi yeah. in Finland. Okay, in Finland, um, yeah. So every manufacturer's got their own sort of test facility yeah. hidden somewhere in icy woods. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk about <laughs> drifting transits on ice, <laughs> getting stuck, <laughs> having to pay hot shots, which is a drink for the technicians to come and pull you out. We'll uh, all those things. Would, you, would you have been involved in the climactic testing of the Jewel? Would you have gone over? We, we didn't get to that stage, mm. but I'm sure in some, some way or form I yeah. would have. Um, obviously, now today, the climatic testing changed a lot. Everything is done, mostly simulation work, computer work, and then you've got your, your facilities that can sort of go down temperatures, elevated temperatures, even altitude, your, your climatic centers. Oh, you do it all in-house. Yeah, so, okay. so the, the actual physical testing has gone down a lot since my days back uh, then. So we had all the fun. Sorry for your current engineer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you went drifting transits mm -hmm. in minus 37 degrees in northern Finland. What a it sounds like a great story. We'll, we'll have you back. Nicole, um, what, a, what a story. Uh, thanks for sharing. It's a, it's a powerful story, you know, and I think that even though it didn't work, 
I'm so glad that someone dreamed that dream and really tried to make it work. You know, it's a cool story. South Africans are brilliant, man. We're brilliant people, you know, resilient people. So thank you. Um, I think let's call it there. Uh, it's been a great conversation as always. You're always welcome. You'll be a VIP at our new office, which will which we'll start talking about publicly soon. Um, Nicole, thanks again. I, uh, I, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Uh, I enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, we'll, we'll make um, the sound available on podcast platforms. And uh, I think maybe, um, maybe we follow this up, like I mentioned, with Quibbers next year. That'll be really cool. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. Yeah, for it. thanks, Nicole. All right, that's us. Um, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, we'd love for you to join us. I think you'll like it. Yeah, um, over 700, 800 videos now. I think on the channel. If you're looking for a used car review, do you know? Do you know what happens sometimes? People tweet at me. It's not called tweet anymore. It's what they post at me or whatever Elon Musk has changed it to, and they say, "Oh, why didn't you review this car?" Like they'll say, "Like, oh, you didn't review the Arteon or something," you know. And I'll just be like. Here's the link, you know. So <laughs> if, you, if you're looking for a used car review, we probably have it on the site, actually. If we don't have it, then let me know and we'll try and make it happen as well. Nicola, great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, we're out of here. Be safe. We'll see you on the next one. Cars.coza. Are you busy trying to decide between two cars, three cars, four cars, five cars, six cars? We have an excellent compare tool on our site, which will help you make sense of all the different pricing and all the different specs. You'll find it on our main site, as well as in our app. It's super slick, it's easy to use, it's highly detailed, it's constantly updated with the latest information and pricing, and I can guarantee you it'll make your life a ton easier. Check it out on our website, link in the description below.